it's great uh, to see such a good turnout on our first event of the 2021-22 um, program of the Railway Division Southeast Centre. Um, I'm just going to do a few um, introduction slides and then hand over to Dave and Paul who are here to talk to us about um, the uh, new deep tube trains for London. So tonight um, we've got myself, Toby Johnson. I'm the chair of the Armaki Railway Division Southeast Centre. Um, Kevin Moore, who is our secretary, and he's going to be um, assisting tonight uh, with the Q&A session. And we've also got Chen uh, Ti Ying, um, she's our committee member, who's doing a great job of um, controlling teams behind the scenes. Um, so welcome everybody tonight's agenda. Um, we've done the introductions from the IMFE side. Um, I'm just going to give you um, a quick introduction to our next event. So it's in your calendars and fresh in your minds. Um, and then we're going to go um, on to our main event. Um, so this one's for your uh, diaries, Monday the 18th of October. David Mansfield uh, from um, TFL will be talking about the Barking Riverside Extension. Um, so David will um, give us um, quite a comprehensive presentation on to the extension of the London Overground Network to the Barking Riverside. Um, so please make sure you've got that one in your diaries and um, look out for registration soon. So. Um, tonight, we are joined by um, two experts uh, from Siemens Mobility. Um, I couldn't think of two people who would be more appropriate to speak tonight. Um, we've got Dave Hooper, who's Director of Major Programs um, for Rolling Stock, and uh, who some of our uh, London Underground colleagues might recognise. Paul Wright, who's uh, Operations and Maintenance Manager for Siemens Mobility. Um, and I'd like to um, ask them um, if they would now take control and um, give us their presentation. Thanks very much. Okay, I'll just share screen. Yeah, apologies. My uh, my broadband, no joke, has just gone down. So I've just had to switch to the iPad. <laughs> ah. can, you, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Hence why my camera's gone off. We can hear you loud and clear, back, clear Dave. Um, I should have mentioned we will do um, Q&A at the end of the, the presentation. So um, put your co uh, questions in the chat um, or we'll have to raise hands at the, at the end of the presentation. OK, over to you, Dave. OK, um, thank you for inviting us uh, this evening and uh, welcome everybody. Um, I thought it would uh, be a good idea just to start off to introduce ourselves, Paul and I. So if I quickly just introduce who I am, some of you may know me from the past, but um, I've been in the rail industry for about 30 years. Um, started with British Rail in 1991, um, into rail track in 94, um, was a regional director in at the start of Network Rail, um, looking after the Wessex area for signaling and maintenance. Um, and I went over to um, be a train operator with First Group up in Manchester for a year or so and helped set up Northern Rail at the start of that franchise before going into Serco um, to be their uh, non-passenger business, non-rail non passenger business MD, which was looking after rail grinding and the, the, the new maintenance trains and things like that. And I came into LU uh, which is probably one of the reasons why I'm sitting here tonight. Um, I came into LU in 2009 as uh, the program director of the Metropolitan Line Upgrade Infrastructure and the, the new S stock trains um, and worked with the team there to deliver the uh, first S stock on, uh, on the Met Line on time, which we're very proud of. And it's good that some people who are in that team with me now are. Um, then are actually um, in the team now for um, for what we're doing now on the Piccadilly line, which is which is it's great. Um, 
having joined through um went on to uh, run a construction company osborne set up their infrastructure business and i actually joined siemens six years ago tomorrow so it's my anniversary tomorrow in 2015 uh, to deliver the Thameslink program for Siemens. Um, and uh, that's that's sort of me. I'll pass over to Paul just to give a brief introduction. OK, uh, yeah, I'm Paul Wright. Again, uh, some people may know me for if they're from London Underground and that. Um, I joined the rail industry in 2002 after spending 13 years in the Royal Navy uh, maintaining helicopters. Uh, so I did all my engineering apprenticeship and everything in the in the military. So I entered the rail industry 2002 to work for Bombardier Transportation. Um, I was a technical support engineer initially down at Brighton uh, on the Govia project, the 377 Electrostars, introducing them new trains to the Southern Fleet. Uh, from that, I within a year or so, I took on the operation of the Turbostar Fleet uh, for Bombardier at Selhurst. Uh, and managed the uh, the technical support, the teacher plus A contract for the Turbostar sort of side uh, for Bombardier, and then eventually was the general manager for the teacher plus A contracts uh, with Bombardier, looking after the the support at Brighton, Selhurst, and um, Bedford. So introducing all them three seven sevens on the on the Southern Fleet. Uh, from there, I I moved to. Transport for London uh, in 2009. I joined the district line as the fleet manager for the district line uh, to basically introduce the new subsurface trains uh, into the district line, the S7s. Uh, I was a fleet manager there for until uh, 2018, so just over nine, around nine years, just over, uh, where I saw the introduction of the S7s, uh, saw the rebuild of uh, Ealing Common Depot. Uh, Upminster Depot, so I had quite a big uh, sort of input into bringing in new stock, uh, trying to put a maintenance, looking at the maintenance, how we do the maintenance in the depots, and restructuring the whole team so that we could maintain the fleet out of Ealing, Upminster, and um, Hammersmith Depot, because uh, eventually all the S7s were running on the Hammersmith line, the district line, and the circle line. Uh, so from there, I was then uh, in 2018 joined Siemens. Uh, so I've been here for nearly three years. Uh, I joined Heathrow Express to take on the Heathrow Express uh, project uh, to move it originally to a new depot. Uh, then consequently there was changes to that. Um, and so obviously in the Heathrow Express I then moved uh, within about a year onto this project, onto the Deep Tube project uh, as the operations and maintenance manager. So I think my, my experience has really been, yeah, I've, in the rail industry of introducing sort of new trains, working with a new maintenance regime, helping customers with their new maintenance regimes uh, and that. So uh, yeah, that's me, that's my introduction. Dave, back to you. You'll probably see my pictures come back now. <laughs> <laughs> so we go on to the next slide then and we'll, we'll start. I'll keep my headphones on, so I've got two two feeds. Should be always have a plan B. That's what I learned a long time ago, um, and it'll be no different on this project either. Um, <laughs> so first of all, just a just a quick overview. I mean, from our point of view, from Siemens' point of view, this was a great to have, um, and obviously the contract is called the Deep Tube um, contract, and it. It has options that covers um, of all the all the deep tube lines in the contract. So there's the Piccadilly line that we we've just finished the design on at the moment, and this we will focus most of our time on today. Um, it's 94 trains in a base order with some options uh, to increase that. Um, when the funding is available for TFL, um, and obviously the things about the Bakerloo line, which which you read in the press, we're all very keen to. To, to, to start on that one as well. That'll be 78 um, trains. And then again, in the future, the Central Line um, and the Waterloo and City Lines. So in total, from a contract point of view, there's a potential 310 trains. Um, but from my point of view, as the um, director accountable for this contract, um, it's all about getting these first 94 
Um, if we get if we do a great job on the first 94, CFL um, get the funding for, for for the other lines, and I'm sure that that we'll be working together for hopefully for 20 years plus. And I think that's a that's a key point to make right at the start because um, we see this as uh, not just a normal contract. It's very much a partnership uh, with where the two companies will be working together for potentially over 20 years or longer. Um, and there's not many contracts um, that you can that, that you get involved with that have that sort of um, longevity. Um, and it's just it's really it's I'm really very um, pleased and very proud to be to be part of this, not only at the beginning, but but um, I hope I'll be here <laughs> to um, to see some of the other options through as well. Um, the key date from the contract point of view finally got this signed in um, between us uh, in November 2018. And the picture that you saw uh, in the uh, title slide at the beginning, that was a picture of me on my first day at Deep Tube um, outside the lawyer's office, actually, where the contract was signed. Um, just a bit of uh, nostalgia there. Um, <laughs> um, we started the manufacturing of the trains. Uh, we started that this summer in Vienna um, and we'll come on to the details of manufacturing later in the presentation. But we plan to obviously start producing trains in the UK uh, in late 23. And we'll I'll talk about the Ghoul sites as well later on in the presentation. Um, and most importantly, we'll have the first passenger train in service in early 25 and the last train in service by the end of 26. So that gives you a, a flavour um, of um, what we're talking about. Pictures on the right hand side, just before you flip through, just because the nice, um, obviously the one above, that's the, that was the, that's the, that's the latest view, of what the train will look like. Um, and the, um, the, the, the 3D drawing below just gives you an example Again, Paul will go into some more data, detail on this, but obviously um, it's just just the way we have a whole system of uh, how these trains are designed now. It's not much paper involved anymore. Uh, it's all on, uh, it's all through, through our software systems. You go on to the next slide. So that gives you the overview of what, what the contract's about. As I said, this is not just a contract. In fact, the contract, put that to one side, um, it's about the people who work on it. Um, none of us back in the, you know, November 2018 and, uh, and the start of 2019, the picture uh, on the left-hand side here is actually the first, uh, what we call collaboration events uh, in Vienna. That's on, the, that's on the shop floor in the Vienna factory. Uh, in January 2019, we all came together um, as a team to, to launch the project and we went into um, various workshops type thing that day and started to talk how, how, how are we going to work together? And none of us knew at that time what was coming. Um, we all know that projects have its, um, they always have their challenges and everything like that. I'm sure that lots of people in the audience tonight have worked on big programs and you know what I'm talking about. None of us quite understood. Uh, no, nobody knew about uh, COVID at that point. Um, but I think um, looking back, and I've said this um, in some of the articles that you may have may have read, the the key thing for us is that we we started the way we wanted to go on. We came together as one team. We call it the DTAB one team, not because that's just the name we're just pretending, but we this is un, an unusual type contract for Siemens um, and I'll explain why usually you have a you have a platform and a product um, and it gets adapted a little bit for for, for customer environments um, but all, all, mostly it's a it's a it's a it's a product that we've sold into the into a particular market or, or railway obviously this this train is completely um, novel and no other customer will buy this train this is purely for um, London Underground because of the, the nature of, of the railway and also the nature of the contract. There's people been working on this on, on this contract 
or not the contract, but on the on the concept of this train for, for years. Um, some of the people in the team um, within the Siemens and on the LU team have been on this project for 10 years before the, the, the contract even got signed. Um, and again, uh, there's not many projects I can think of um, that, that, that has have people working on them for such a long time in, in sort of the in 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 the in the startup to get this to get this to where it is. So for a lot of people, this just to get to where we are is a real achievement to actually get this um, get the go ahead to 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 actually build the train. Now with the team, um, with the team when we first got to in, in Vienna, we then decided various things of how we work together. We had a lots of workshops in that first year face to face the, the, the picture on there was right hand side of, was one of the workshops that we did in London um, but in each of these workshops we we explored how we should work together as a team and what the priorities were um, as we as we went through the um, the early stages of the contract you just go on to the next slide so I just want to explain so what we came up with in that first year is what we call the charter. Um, and you've probably seen things like this before. Um, and I'm not saying that it's novel. I'm not saying that it's new, but this is ours. So if you if you give me the pleasure of just explaining it, um, because it's important, because actually at the time when we did this, um, it was for something for us to follow, you know, in, in those times where you, you get those discussions, which um, in, and the challenges that approach you as a team. We wrote this so we never get personal. We're all on the same team. We all want the same outcome. We all want the same goals. Um, but we didn't realize that we would be going into uh, lockdown situations. Um, and actually having this, though, really helped us get through those times. And if we hadn't have done this sort of work, um, early on, then it, it would have been um, it, it would have been really difficult. I'm not saying that it wasn't challenging, it wasn't difficult doing everything virtually and online. Obviously, we're here tonight uh, online rather than in London, so we're getting used to it now. But um, having not, if you didn't have a foundation of trust uh, amongst the team members, then it would have been even more difficult. So the picture is what we call our vision. And yes, it's got no bogeys. It's, it's a common joke we have with our team in Gratz. That's plan B, guys. If you if you don't come forward with the bogeys, we'll carry it ourselves. Um, now that's that's. <laughs> um, the idea was, as you can see, um, in the picture, there's there's the Siemens colours people and there's uh, there's there's the uh, LU people. The point is, is that it's a mix. We're both there holding the train up together. And we're presenting this to a diverse population of London, which are standing on the platform. That's that band of people in the background. Um, and the strap line may seem quite simple, but a lot of thought went into this um, in a particular workshop. And this obviously there was there was many variations of this, but it was a double meaning in the end from the from the program team, the project team members. It's our train. Um, yeah, we've designed this together. As I say, it's been a long journey um, before before Siemens was appointed this contract. But it's it's very much our train. This is not going to go anywhere else in the world. It's purely for London. And and actually, as a team, it's about enjoying the journey because we're on this um, journey for for a long time. As I said, we may be on this for for over 20 years. But certainly for the Piccadilly line, um, we've already been into this journey. We're in the third year now. And obviously, be another um, three, four years um, as as we produce and and, and get the trains, etc. So it's a it's a long time to spend together. But from a customer point of view, we also wanted, from a passenger point of view, we wanted people to feel that it's our train as well, and they will enjoy the train, enjoy the journey when they when they get on the train. So that's where the the double meaning from the strap line came. Um. Our values, trust and respect one another, ownership, ownership of what we need to do and collaborative in the way that we do it, not just words, 
very easy to say. Um, we've had many, many examples um, where, where it's been put into practice. And also show inclusiveness and empathy for people and our stakeholders. We're in the public eye, so we and, and we both we've got different stakeholders, um, and we have to constantly review what we're doing um, to make sure that we 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 understand what people need require at certain times. And you don't you don't get it right all the time, but we we really do try to 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 include. Um, understand what our stakeholders need um, throughout this journey. The ethics are, are really quite personal to, to the team. Um, and um, when we put these down, as I said, right at the beginning in 2019, um, actually we, we did it as an exercise and they still they still they still work today. I don't see any reason when I, when you read through these Actually, there's no reason to change. You're always good to review where you are, but the the this sets the tone of how the the team um, it sets the tone of how, how the team actually work together. Um, and it, in those discussions, design discussions, contract discussions, whatever, any meeting where um, where the team come together, this is just gives us guidance and also allows us to realise, as I said right at the beginning, this is not. It shouldn't make, never be personal. We're all actually trying to do this to, to do the right thing, and, and and we all want the same goals. So, without this charter, I'm I'm a firm believer that um, yes, what you write down on paper is easy. Actually, to live it and breathe it and act it um, is what the team have done for the last two and a half years, and to. And that's why coming through the whole of the lockdown periods in the UK, Austria and Germany, and remember this is a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a team with, with many locations. Um, without, without this sort of charter and guidance and all the work that we put in at the beginning, um, I'm, I'm truly believe we wouldn't have actually um, uh, delivered the design um, on time as we did back in March this year. Paul, oh, I think I'll hand over to you to, I think I've bored everyone enough about collaboration and being one team. <laughs> so I'll hand okay. over to you now. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> okay, so this this is the, the nine car train for the Piccadilly line. This is what we uh, are producing uh, and what will go on to the production line. Uh, as you can see, it's quite um, sort of, a non-conventional design uh, for a normal sort of metro train. Um, it is design that has been used in trams and maybe light rail, uh, but not normally for uh, the sort of conventional. So we, we've got uh, a nine car train, uh, the Piccadilly Lines nine car, 130 meters. And it have 10 bogies, uh, eight power bogies and two trailer bogies. Um, Obviously, the normal design you would tend to see if it was a nine car, conventionally you would see 18 bogies. Uh, so we reduced quite a number of sort of uh, the bogey numbers. Um, and the main thing is just really just to give a, an overview of what the train potentially looks like in this slide. It's not really a lot of detail in here. Um, so what I'm going to go through over the next sort of few slides is how did we arrive at this design? Yeah, what sort of challenges did, were we faced with as a team? And not, not just Siemens, yeah, uh, Siemens and TfL. We've worked jointly together, as Davis um, stated. Yeah, it's been a, a, a one-team approach the whole way through uh, in the in the design. So, what were our challenges? So we had quite a number of technical and operational challenges that we had to do for a Piccadilly line. Uh, we need to be innovative um, in order to design and deliver a train with all the requirements uh, that were been imposed. Uh, basically, it's under the contract. Um, so the pick line, as you know, it's quite uh, the quite a tight sort of gauge. Uh, so we've got infrastructure constraints. And obviously, we've got a, this gauge has got to go not only uh, for the Piccadilly line, you've got to look at the Bakerloo line, the Central line, and the Waterloo and City line. So it has to fit all these gauges. Yeah, so we've got a limited installation space. 
as you can see from the picture on the right hand side yeah that's <laughs> the, the gauge around the train is really tight yeah you don't have much space above and not much space below to be honest um, when these tra the other trains were originally designed basically all you have under there is traction packages air supplies uh, and other ancillaries but nothing else yeah it's quite sort of basic sort of functions uh, that you've got on on sort of a metro current Piccadilly line sort of fleets and the other sort of fleets. One of the key areas though that we have to always take into account is safety. Safety for all. Yeah, we're in, going to be introducing a, an advanced train, but with advanced technology, you have to look at the safety as well. It's fine if you can remotely operate sort of things and everything else, but how does that interact with the operation of the train, the driver who's driving the train, all them sort of systems, the control systems, yeah? And we've also got to minimize platform gap. I think people may have traveled on some of the lines and you see the gaps between the, the platform and, and the train are quite wide. And obviously the, the standard sort of message over the Tannoy system, mind the gap, which LUL is renowned for. Um, but safety is always paramount. Working together, both LUL and ourselves, that's one of the key aspects that we have to deliver. Another aspect was reduced track wear. Track wear uh, increases maintenance costs for the track people. Yeah, so we need to minimize vehicle mass. So the weight of the vehicle needs to be as light as possible yeah, so that we can minimize, minimize the, the wear on the track. The wheel rail interface as well also plays a big impact on this area. We need to save money in operation, energy efficiency. As we look at sort of um, energy, yeah, we all want to be more sort of uh, conservative with our greenhouse gases and consume less energy yeah so this is one of the, a key sort of area that we've got to sort of look at now a new train more systems on it that requires more energy surely so it, it, it's all about looking at the whole picture not just the individual sort of systems these trains need to have be cooler yeah need air conditioning we have all travel probably on the underground in the, the heat of the summer yeah, it gets very warm down there. Yeah, and if you've experienced traveling on the subsurface trains, it's nice to get into a cool sort of train, yeah, on the underground, but these are for the deeper ones as well. So it'd be nice, the fact that you've got a nice passenger environment that's cool, keeps people cooler in the summer and keeps them warm in the winter. So there's that technology that has to be in, uh, put onto the train as well. With all that, all these different systems, we need a better reliability. So we need good design, superior design. We need good quality components. Yeah, so the last, the failure rate is reduced considerably because obviously with better reliability becomes, you get reduced, you should get reduced failure. And also as well, that should reduce your maintenance cost for any corrective work and also planned maintenance cost. So we use, where can we use digital to help us reduce the maintenance costs. So there's all them aspects. Technology is advancing at such a rate at the moment that, you know, that there's a lot of technology out there that you can put onto a train. We need to be innovative. Yeah, new traction system, articulation concept. I'll come to the articulation concept later on, um, how we sort of arrived at, the, you know, having sort of less bogies on the train. How do we get to that sort of area? But also one of the key things is, as well as having a new train uh, and that's energy efficient, you also need to maximize the number of seats. Yeah, so the customer needs to maximize how many people they can get into the train, the standing space. So all the space is a premium in the train. And we need quicker passenger exchange. So we need to maximize the door width so you can get more passengers in and minimize the dwell times, door opening, closing times. So all of that, all of these challenges, these aren't the only challenges, yeah. But as you can see with the right hand side, the gauging is one of the key sort of areas. Also, if not fully representative, but we've we've managed to improve the height of the train, yeah, inside for the passenger. So the floor 
needed to be. We need to get basically the floor lower so that as if you've ever traveled on a pit train, when you get onto it, if you're five, 11, six foot and above, people are having to duck and they're always moving the head to one side and everything else. So it was trying to get it so that actually people can walk through comfortably and walk through from one train, one carriage to the other comfortably. The only fleets you can do that at the moment on the London Underground, on the underground side, are the subsurface. Uh, so all of this is to try and sort of move that on and uh, get the passenger flowing much, much better. So these are the challenges. However, out of these challenges, some of the three main ones that drive uh, sort of your cost of operation as well are energy consumption, track damage, and maintenance. <clears throat> so we've got all these challenges, yeah, that have come along. Um, so energy consumption, again, being one of the key sort of areas. So we need to reduce energy so we need more a lot of tr new trains now use regen braking yeah so this is one of the areas you have to focus on regenerative braking yeah so we're not using brake pads brake shoes to to sort of and and that also adds to other wear and tear of the train itself the weight of the train is key for energy consumption the heavier you train the more power you need to accelerate, the more you need to brake. So it needs to be lighter, yeah? And one of the areas is train resistance, the, the flow of air around the train, yeah? Yeah, I'm not producing a Formula One car, yeah? But you have to take all the airflow into consideration, your airflow into your filters, yeah? But that doesn't cause too much drag on the train, which too much drag on the train will then cause uh, more energy to be um, required. And the, one of the key things is reduce energy consumption. All of this, all these three link into each other. Track damage, yeah, again, um, contact with the track, yeah, the vehicle mass linked to energy and everything else. So you know, the lighter the vehicle, the better it is for the wheel rail interface sort of side, performance of the bogey, you need a, a, a short axle based bogey um, which helps for uh, the curvature of the track and the gauging uh, and all the dimensions of the train so all of these play key to the sort of you know what what can we put onto the train that will help with the wheel rail interface to reduce the track damage so you've got um, there are things out there uh, adhesion modifier you've got stick loops all that sort of stuff to look at you know, if we can apply that where it's required rather than having greasing points out in the, on the track, then this reduces your track damage. And a key area is maintenance. You've got track maintenance and train maintenance, yeah? So if we can reduce track damage, there's less track maintenance, yeah? Less rails, rails need to be replaced less. The maintenance of the train itself, yeah? We've got to look at the maintenance. We optimize it where possible. Okay, so in worked on previous sort of fleets and everything else, you know, sometimes you've got to where you, you're then looking at the overhaul. So we maximize where the overhaul needs to be. So we reduce the number of overhauls required through the life of the train. So, and we're looking at digital where that can help us as well. Um, and we look at how much effort's required for the maintenance. Yeah, uh, the maintenance cost is quite a big sort of drive for any sort of train yeah particularly in spares uh, and that so the fact that all these trains would be the spares would be able to be used on all the different sort of fleets as well that helps in reducing the cost rather than having a different train for every different line already uh, london underground have that in some aspects on the, the subsurface where they have the same train the s7 and the s8 so these were all the challenges that we're faced with um, in order to design a train. And if you think about since what Dave was mentioning earlier is a lot of this we've had to do virtually. Yeah, originally we were able to go over to see our colleagues, the customer was able to meet our engineers in Germany and things like that. We've had to do all of this virtually 
and arrive at a design. So how did we, from these challenges, how did we get to the design? So we've had to be innovative, yeah, use technology and digital, yeah. So what are key things uh, that's pretty uh, unique with this sort of train is it's multi-articulated joint between the cars. You've got different types. You've got the conventional sort of type uh, of train uh, that has that you would have two bogies per, per car. Uh, you've got semi-articulation and you've got fully articulated. So fully articulated would be what you see with the Eurostar where the, the bogey sits between the two cars. Yeah, so it sits in the middle. The benefit of multi-articulation is it gives more space. Uh, the, Full articulation, which you've got on sort of where your bogey sits in the middle, that that constrains sort of space, particularly around sort of the gangway sort of area uh, and that. So it can potentially, because of the gauge and the tight gauge and the height and everything else, it would in, interfere with um, the, the height of the, the gangway, how, where the floor was, but also as well, uh, fully articulated bogies have a long wheelbase, whereas a with the multi-articulated joint, we can have a short wheelbase, which helps with gauging and the curvature of the track and the, all them sort of areas. So this is quite um, a, a unique sort of a design for metro trains. You'll see it on trams or even light rail. Uh, but what this does do for us is the fact that we can now make use of the space and it reduces the bogies, the number of bogies. So we only need 10 bogies on a nine car train, which reduces weight considerably. Uh, the gangways as well would be multi uh, with a multi articulated joint. The gangways themselves can be, don't have to be as long, uh, they can be shorter, and it, it just enough to be able to compensate with the yaw uh, and the pitch and everything else as, as that carriage sort of moves. So obviously we then have the bridge cars. Um, this gives us a lot of space to be able to put a lot of components. One of the key things with this train is the fact that everything, all the major components um, are underneath the train. So you've got your all the batteries, HVAC, HVAC being the key one. A lot of trains tend to see the HVAC sits on top, on the roof. With these, the HVAC sit underneath the car. Yeah, so the cab is air conditioned and all the saloons are air conditioned. And all of this space is, is a premium and has been one of our major challenges to actually produce the train, to have light, lightweight, um, and obviously to have all the systems that we need in order to, uh, to function and to meet the requirements basically of what is expected. And we've done this together with as one team with London Underground. So with the bridge cars, obviously every other car is bridged. Uh, yes, we have some challenges when we come to, um, when you have to support the, the, the bridge cars, but they are all things that we, we work with. Um, we're working very closely with the customer on developing what they need in their depots, uh, and everything. So with, if we could move on to the motor bogey, um, as, as I said, there's eight of these, there's eight motor bogies and two trailer bogies. Um, <clears throat> these are permanent magnet synchronous motor on sort of each, uh, on the powers, you've got two of them fit to each power bogey. It's a lightweight bogey um, and it's an inside frame type, as you can see with the 3D model, all the, the bearings and that's it inside of the wheel of the wheel of, of the pan um, and having fewer bogies has created obviously more sort of space and having the short wheelbase helps us with the gauging as well so if we move to inside the cars oh the, the other thing we do have on on the boards as well are uh, all sort of the, the stick loop uh, that will sit on the, the flange uh, at the back and at the, uh, the back of the flange on the flange. And then we've also got adhesion modifiers as well, which all will help with um, the wheel rail interface. So as you can see from the actual car, 
uh, we have to use all the space underneath the seats. This space is premium. It's not unusual. You on the other London and underground fleets, they use uh, the undersea boxes. Um, but basically, <clears throat> the, the, this, the amount of systems we've had to put in, um, and the, all the, the for future sort of proof as well, um, it, it's been a real challenge to try and get everything within the these seat box sort of spaces. Uh, it's all been sort of a, a tight sort of fit. So there's nothing mounted in the roof <clears throat> apart from speakers cameras and uh, sort of tft screens which are uh, that run down the side which i'll come on to later so everything sits underneath so from a maintenance perspective <clears throat> we're going to be underneath the, the train most of the time maintaining the components <clears throat> Another thing that we've had to utilize as well for space constraints are uh, conventionally you would use circuit breakers. We were using uh, SSPC, so solid state uh, power circuits, um, because all of that you can combine a lot more and condense everything a lot more than having as what you usually see behind the cab uh, back wall is a, open the open the cupboard and there's a massive um circuit breakers that's not the case with this particular train so technology innovation miniaturization all being in, uh, used where we can uh, to to pack everything into this particular this design so we obviously got to this design the thing is is then how do you check it how do you check that you can do certain functions? How do you check that you know that the cab's going to be right with the operators? How do you check that you can maintain the train uh, and things like that? So we've employed quite a lot of um, mock-ups. Make the changes. Yeah. So first of all, we've got the um, the cab mock-up and the saloon mock-ups. The cab mock-up uh, was has been built in Germany, and the saloon mock-up uh, has been built in the UK. So all of this as well um, has again been done virtually. Um, so the meetings around sort of the cab. If you imagine, you, you know, you got yourselves and the the UK team and the customer in the UK, we can't travel to Germany, uh, and we've got a cab mock-up being built. Um, basically, we employed virtual sort of the media, did it all virtually through cameras. So <clears throat> if you see the bottom left uh, picture, uh, what we did do uh, was use, because some of the key areas in the design uh, for the operational sort of side and the maintenance of the train rest around human factors. Human factors play a key part in the design of any train. Uh, or, or, or a lot of things nowadays, particularly <clears throat> our, our trains, they, they play a big sort of part. We've we've done a lot with human sort of factors. So, for example, with the cab, <clears throat> we have uh, a number. We had a number of individuals of different varying heights and sizes that would go into the cab. We would film them uh, because we had the cameras here as well that were situated in various different parts of the cab. And we would film these individuals getting into the cab. So using the step on the outside, you know, climbing in, how was that, you know, the human factors around that sort of thing. And then sitting in the seat, can you reach these buttons? Can you, what's your line of sight like? Yeah, and all that has been looked at, utilizing, done it initially virtually um, and utilizing many different individuals to try and, get the, the, the size range of different occupants, different drivers. Um, so that we can we can actually make the cab uh, ergonomic and fit for every type of operator. The other sort of area that we sort of looked at um, with the cab, which we've just done that is the seat. 
we've had a mock-up of the seat. Yeah, that has actually been brought into the UK. So we've had the operators sitting in the seat, yeah, seeing what needs to be changed, what's good, what areas, did, what isn't so good about, and constantly taking that on board and changing the design to, to, so that we can actually produce a train that when we finally comes into it and the drivers operate it, they know they've had an input into how they can operate in that cab and how things are utilised. With the saloon, again, that's been utilised a lot. Um, so as well as being able to look at what the train looks like aesthetically, so London Underground have been able to visit this, under COVID rules, been able to visit the saloon mock-up, uh, which was built in the UK. And they've been able to go inside, uh, look at the lighting, how things are illuminated, what's the glare, you know, the, the glare like. Um, <clears throat> for example, in these, you'll have TFT screens. Yeah, you'll have LED uh, monitors in here. So instead of the conventional sort of cards, postal cards you see on the current sort of fleets that are put in there, adverts will come up electronically. Yeah, so you'll have uh, adverts on on these screens. Uh, and that, but with things like the glare of the light, we, we had to look at that, how that affects you being able to see the screens. And it's all these things you have to consider. Yeah. Um, you know, operates the grab handles are all in the right sort of area that wherever you stand, yeah, within that saloon, you can grab a handle so that you, you know, you feel safe if you need to grab something. Um, and all that work being done collaboratively with the customer. One of the other things we looked at with the saloon mock-up was the air conditioning. Now, this isn't the air conditioning that's going under the tray, but it's a similar performance air conditioning. So it has all the characteristics of what we would be deploying underneath the tray. But we set the train up so that we could monitor the, the air conditioning, the flow of the air through the carriages, so that, that was was right. So where you stood in the train, you you know, there weren't major hot spots and things like that. And we had to get that right as well. So the ducting all had to be replicated as it would be on the train. And we learned from that and we learned a lot, you know, from doing all these mock-ups. Another key mock-up has been within the maintenance. Um, so we've had an underframe mock-up and a seat mock-up. So you see on the bottom left here, uh, these are 3D mannequins. When we, as Dave alluded to right at the beginning, uh, you know, the 3D pictures, we initially started designing everything by 3D, no paper. So we, we took the dimensions of pits from the customer and working with the customer, showing the 3Ds, we put mannequins in a different percentile. Yeah, you've got different hands you can put in. And everything, so we, what we could change, we change while we're doing the 3D. But sometimes there's nothing better than being able to just physically see something. And can you put your hand in there? Yes, the 3D model shows you can, but can you physically? So we, we had the seat mock-ups built uh, here on the right, the under, the under seat mock-ups. So the seats would go up, the seats would lock, would eventually will lock safely, yeah, so that the maintainer can go in there. And it's just about access and access to these sort of cables through um, access panels. Things have changed, yeah, we've changed things by utilizing these uh, mock ups. The, uh, the fact that, you know, can you get a hand in there? Can you get everything that you need to get to if you've got a glove on? And it's all these aspects that we've been looking at. Uh, so that we can, again, it's all human factors, yeah? Um, nobody wants to be sort of really, it, it, space is tight and there are some challenges, but where we can make it easy to maintain this train, we are doing. The underframe mock-up itself, this is um, a TFL facility where we've put it at. Uh, we've managed to align it with the tunnel just to give it a little bit more of an effect. 
Uh, but the black bars represent the salt bars. And obviously, this is, these are the pits, uh, dimensions that we've been working with London Underground with. But what we also did with this was make the pits adjustable so we can change the heights of the pits and the side pits to try and optimize where the best height's going to be for all the different sort of challenge, you know, all the different percentile of people. Uh, yes, there are going to be positions where somebody might have you know, we'll find it more difficult than others, but what you need is the optimum sort of depth. So we've been working with them. You know, you, you manage to just put the head items on the on the um, on the mock-up, and then you can sort of drop some of the filters, see if you can get in, see access. Here down in the, the middle, you see this is uh, sort of our, our de-icing sort of side. Uh, so we can see what, what sort of equipment the customer is going to have. And again, we have, these aren't just ourselves doing these under frame mock-ups. We have, these are joint meetings with a customer. So we, we, we have people from the depot, we have people from the depot upgrade sort of team, and obviously uh, Siemens sort of people. We also have, while we're doing these, our engineers back in Germany and Vienna online. Uh, we've got a, we have a camera set up. Again, we're doing things virtually. Uh, it's been challenging, um, but I think to a point where we, we, we've got pretty good at it, where we're working with people virtually and that nobody's over talking anybody else and that. So, because <clears throat> ultimately we all want to get to the right position that, you know, we can maintain the trade. So, one of the other aspects of maintenance or, or the trade itself. Is digital. This is obviously uh, the train coming in in 2025 into service. Yeah, so we need to we're maximising what we can with digital. Yeah, so one of the key aspects of digital is that that train can communicate with a landside equipment. So in all the stations, there'll be Wi-Fi. Yeah, so the train will have antennas at the front and the back so it can communicate with the Wi-Fi in the stations. So we have an off-train communication. Yeah, uh, with that, the data will be prioritised. So we'll have prioritised data transmission. So whatever urgent messages need to come off that train, they'll come off at the next station. Yeah, so that if you've got, you've got somebody monitoring the train, um, in their, their control, in the customer's control room, they can monitor the train and can understand the latest status of that train. Yeah, so they get all the data coming off, they get alerts coming off, uh, which isn't unusual. You see this on a lot of sort of, uh, uh, sort of newer stock as well. Um, they've got it with a subsurface where they're getting data coming off the train. But it's also what you do with that data, yeah, and that's what we're going to be working with the customer on how we work with that data. That data also helps us to optimize maintenance. Yeah. So all that data builds up um, and it helps us to sort of get achieve the best within our maintenance. It also helps us with condition monitoring of the train. So we can monitor the train. We can understand, you know, potentially where the next failure is going to happen. And it's all about understanding that data that's coming off the train and interpreting that and being able to work with that sort of data. The, the, the amount of data that comes off a train is just phenomenal. Yeah, you, all the different sensors and everything else. It's, and you work with that data to get the best sort of performance out of your train. This, this train will also have facility for remote control functions. That doesn't mean somebody can drive the train remotely yeah it, it basically certain systems will be able to switch on and off like if it's stabling at a siding or in a depot and we want to conserve sort of things or switch certain things on and off we have the we'll have the ability to do that but nothing will interfere with the operation of the train yet yeah? the driver is still in full control of that train so it's not a case of being able to you know work it from so your xbox or anything like that Testing, this train will be testing itself. We have automated testing. 
yeah, be constantly testing itself every 24, 40, whatever sort of testing is required, that train will be testing itself. So we can understand if a system's failing, we can have early warnings of if a system's going to be failing as well, so that we can proactively work with, like for example, with the line controllers. Yeah, we can work with the depots, so we can prioritize trains coming back, and all all about getting the data off the train. We'll also have the ability to remote software management, so we'll be able we'll be able to upload software to the train. Yeah. It won't switch over to that software straight away. Yeah, you have to have an intervention with that, but we're able, you don't no longer have to go out there with your laptop, connect up, load the software, yeah, to all the different boxes and things like that. You'll be able to remotely upload it all to the train, and when they're done, yeah, you can intervene to switch them all over to the right sort of software. So all of this is just really digital at a glance with the with the sort of train. We're working closely again with London Underground. How do they want to see the format of this data coming off? You know, how do they want their alerts? And that we're, we're working very closely uh, so that they get really what they what they want to work with. Because being involved in early days allows us to do them changes as we develop the as we develop everything. Uh, rather than a later date, or oh, here is a package, or oh, we don't want that like that, we want it like this. That then costs both parties, yeah? So we work together and we get what, basically, ultimately, the customer gets what they want, in a way, because uh, of early days of working together. So this is basically the train, um, where we've come from with the requirements, yeah, the hard challenges that we've had. Uh, we still have challenges going forward, um, and we're, you know, still sort of working on uh, sort of areas. But ultimately, this train will deliver these passenger benefits. Um, so there'll be an environmental benefit. You're using less more less energy. Yeah, the customer will be able to travel, uh, take on more passengers. Yeah, they'll be able to increase the frequency of the trains because of the technology and the fact that you can bring in uh, ATC as well uh, with the trains to help with the signaling to move more trains uh, sort of through. But that that's not yet. Yeah. Uh, but the, the key thing is more passengers. Yeah. Uh, life cycle costs, reducing the life cycle cost of the train. Uh, everybody has to watch the pennies now. Um, you know, so if we can reduce, we have to reduce that cost for the customer with London Underground TfL. So the fact that we've got a lighter train, fewer bulkies, yeah, this all tends to be in track friendly as well, uh, thus reducing hopefully track deterioration. And the fact that they ultimately the fair paying passenger can travel on uh, an air conditioned train. Yeah, so no longer going to, you know, important meetings and things like that or, or meeting family and friends. And then it's the dreaded in the summer, I've got to go on the, on the tubes and it's going to be hot. Yeah, people will be able to travel on the train. It'll be nice and cool. So and the fact that we'll have walkthrough carriages as well. So there's a free passenger flow, which helps at stations for disembarking and embarking. So you can move around the train a lot easier. So the ultimate thing now is obviously we've designed a train. It's now where are we going to, how do we build it? Yeah, where are we going to manufacture it? So back over to Dave. Thanks, Paul. So what we have, um, D-type trains is a is a twin site concept. Um, here's a picture of some of my colleagues in uh, Vienna where we're doing infrastructure works. Um, to expand the factory in Vienna. This will be a new commissioning hall there purely for uh, the new trains. So we start them, as I said, we've already started the manufacturing in Vienna and the first trains will come out of Vienna and we'll do the type tests at our centre at Wildenraff. Um, and then from there, um, we will also do um, a series of obviously performance reliability runs and make sure the train's ready to come to London. And in parallel, and I'll go into this more, I've got some more slides, we're obviously creating 
um, a legacy in the UK because we're building a, a new factory in, in Gaul. So by the time we get to um, into 2024, towards the end of 24, we've got two um, parallel production lines, uh, one in Vienna, one in Gaul. Um, and we'll be commissioning the trains um, in, in the UK as well. So, um, and obviously logistically, we will um, make sure that these trains land uh, in London at the right time, um, in the right place for our colleagues at LU to uh, change out the fleet. Um, and by the time we've done this 94 times, it'll be a well-oiled machine. <laughs> if we move on to the next slide, Paul, this gives you um, just an overview of what's being built at Gaul. It's quite a large site. Um, and you can see that for any factory, you've got um, some, obviously we've got um, office and wellbeing buildings. You've got your train formation and commissioning hall, assembly and warehouse, uh, car body storage. Obviously we've got sidings there uh, to be able to um, uh, park up the trains. Uh, and we've got rail access, so which is key because there's this is um, there's a branch line um, that takes you onto the onto the main line. So all the trains will be able to leave the factory um, by rail, uh, which is which is key. They say a, a picture says a thousand words, but we've um, also got um, a video later, and I think that will give you the full appreciation of what we're doing at Cool. But it's not just about um, train manufacturing at Gaul. Uh, we want Gaul, the Gaul village, um, to actually create a, a centre. If you go on to the next side, Paul. We've set up a concept where um, a partnership with Birmingham University. It's a rail accelerator innovation solutions hub for enterprise known as RAISE, the building uh, you see uh, in the picture here, this is this is Ray's, um, Ray's um, phase one. Uh, this building, as you'll see on the video footage uh, in a minute, is uh, well advanced. Um, this will be open in March next year. Siemens will be um, will be the the, um, the the it'd be like the um, foundation tenant. We'll take one of the floors in this building, and the idea is to create a centre on that on that site um, for for people to come together, collaborate. And um, things like there's there will be um, facilities for conferences there as well as office space, coffee shop, which will act as the sort of social hub for the whole site. Um, and phase two, actually, we want to create um, far wider thing where we actually have SMEs coming in, um, working on particular projects um, and hopefully generate uh, a lot of jobs uh, and wealth for the region. Uh, this is this concept's not new. It's been done uh, in the uh, aircraft industry. Uh, there's a site near Rotherham that some of you may know of, um, that, that was set up uh, between Boeing um, and the local council. Um, and 20 years on, that's now home to hundreds of jobs in the aero industry. Um, and this is what we want to create at, um, at Gaul. It's not just about Siemens, it's about for the whole of the rail industry. And um, we're working with, if anyone wants to be involved, um, we raise, whether you're an SME or an individual, you've got projects that you want to benefit from there, um, we're all ears. Um, because this is, uh, for us, this is, as I say, it's more than just about building trains. It's about creating uh, a railway village of, of, of innovation and research for, for, for the next generation. Paul, I think we should have skipped, we should go to the video. Yeah. So we can. <clears throat> just bear with me while I get these ones up and running. So I say, pictures can say a, a thousand words of video, I think really um, brings it home.
Okay, so this is really a, a time lapse video. So that's a rich, I won't talk through it, but it just sort of, no. that's what the site was like, and I'll start. It gives you broadband, Paul. <laughs> oh, it's working before it is downloaded. Patience is a virtual. Mm. We could have had some real wacky music on this, couldn't we? But we would have upset <laughs> some people. You never get the music right for everyone. <laughs> This is Ray's phase one building, as I was just talking about. You see, it's more or less complete. Well, this is what it's like today. As you can see, it's uh, the three trains in the foreground there, they're actually X, some Heathrow Express vehicles we took up there for the local community, used them. Um, it's like classrooms that people can come and visit. As you can see, it's pretty impressive the progress that the team have made up there. So we've got no worries about this facility being ready. <laughs> Come and visit us up in, in Rays next year. Okay. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. So it's a nice slide to ask questions around. <laughs> so we'll, we'll hand back to our hosts um, for, for any questions. Thank you, Dave. Uh, very interesting presentation, fascinating insight. Um, there have been one or two um, questions in the in the chat. We should perhaps start with those. And um, if anyone would like to ask any further questions, uh, questions do please add add to those um what about it security um in terms of um the remote condition monitoring of the train and how that's to be managed is it um something you can answer around um uh the protocols around that that's a question for paul really i think the answer is yes there's many protocols yeah. around data. yeah all, yeah <laughs> basically all the protocols have to be adhered to yeah so that nobody can hack into the train um and that so yeah it, all, all of them aspects have to be that it is a requirement as well that we we have to make sure that the the train is secure that nobody can hack into it thanks paul 
Um, Malcolm de Bell asks whether we can finally consign 24 hour train prep to history. Is that possible? <laughs> I saw that one. Let's hope so. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, yeah, it, the, the train is, is possible. Yeah. Um, question for Andy Batters regarding the golf facility um, and the opening time scales for that. Um, Secondly, around um, recruitment and training strategy. So uh, perhaps worth exploring that briefly. Sorry, the, when, when will we be finished the construction work? When, when, when will it be opened? To begin with? Um, the, the actual construction will be finished um, at the end of 22. And then we go into a whole recruitment phase, um, which obviously we won't start to win 23. We do a whole thing where we'll train people in the facility in Vienna, transfer the skills across. So by the end of the, when we're ready to in full production, we'll have um, around 300 people trained on that site. So it's 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 really good news for the for the area that we're building this in. And so anyone wants to join Siemens, there's plenty of jobs going up in Gaul. Thanks for that. And obviously the skills that are needed, um, is that all through recruitment and training you're going to uh, acquire those? Yeah, um, we've already got apprentices that we've um, employed in the lo from the local uh, area and they're already, some of them, the first 15 have already joined Siemens. They're going through their courses now. So there'll be apprenticeships, um, but obviously um, the, the, the area we've selected, uh, for those of you who don't know, we've we built a, a wind um, blade factory just up the road in Hall some years ago. In fact, uh, let's be honest, the, the, our our lead on the localization construction, Finbar, uh, the um, he led that project. So he's uh, they're already got um, well connected in with the local um, area and how we recruit into. On a on a scale, uh, into 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 factories. Sure. Um. Thanks for that. Um, the question's coming thick and fast. Um, which aspects of the train maintenance are going to be handled handled by the automated system? So talking about kind of uh, monitoring and condition, etc. Is that one for Paul? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> nearly all the systems. To be honest, uh, we're going to be we're going to be looking at that are sort of monitored. Um, so to get the data off all the systems, and we we play we use that data to uh, use for condition based maintenance and and other sort of areas. So yeah, we we're looking at all systems. I think Paul. I'm um, sorry. I think Graham. Um... Graham Neil asked a similar question regarding automatic testing and inspection. Um, which aspects will be automatically inspected? Can you say a bit more about the kind of line side inspection systems, etc.? Uh, yeah, the, uh, well, line side inspection uh, equipment is uh, really something that sort of monitors um, can use to be take take pictures. Uh, can be used to uh, monitor if anything heights of things. Uh, so it all, all just works off datums with lasers uh, and also off HD pictures. Uh, so you can use HD pictures and build up a database uh, to use that. And then you can just compare, it automatically compare. So, for example, if, you, if you've got um, you got once round on something, something's come off or, 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 or a panel or something, then you can use all your HD pictures to quickly identify which trains we may need to get, bring back rather than you doing the normal sort of once rounds where it takes so many days to get through the whole fleet. This can be done a lot more rapidly as well using uh, all the line side inspection. Great, thanks for that. Um, another question from Matt Barkley. Uh, do you foresee any issues with the HVAC being mounted on the underframe? And uh, um, is that not, not something that's been seen before? No, it's not conventional. Um, uh, we will have some challenges, uh, particularly while we're running two different fleets. Um, yeah. But we're aware of that, and that's something that we'll, we'll be 
working closely with uh, our colleagues at the underground and working and monitoring the system so that we we can get them through while we're running sort of two different fleets. Great, thank you. Um, one regarding the uh, intercar articulation, um, does that introduce new challenges for vehicle dynamics and crashworthiness? Um, the dynamics of vehicle dynamics, um, yeah, there's been some sort of challenges, but I'm not aware of anything with crashworthiness. Uh, or obviously, these are these are key areas, uh, just like a bogey. Um, so you know, if any sort of defects on them, then obviously it's like a bogey. Sort of at the end of the day, it's a safety sort of area. But I'm not aware of any sort of crashworthiness issues at all. Thank you. Um, uh, around regarding the uh, um, obsolescence management. So one about the, the windows, windows looking small, was this a conscious design decision? I think that's probably a yes. Um, mm. Certainly was from a client viewpoint. Um, secondly, uh, an, an obsolescence management, is there any consideration of obsolescence over the 40 year life of the train? Yeah, yes, there is. Obsolescence management is a key area. Um, it is something that tends to get uh, sort of forgotten, or quite a difficult sort of area. But this is one of the key, uh, one of the areas we we have to look at obsolescence management with all our suppliers. Um, we set that up with the, with the suppliers, uh, so that obviously we we can identify anything that's going to be an issue, particularly with latest technology. Things can um, sort of quickly go out of date, but uh, we, yes, it is a key area of obsolescence management. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. oh, and regarding automation and maintenance, will that be ready to go from day one or will there be a period of, sort of learning, etc., before that goes live? Uh, it depends on uh, access to the automated sort of areas, uh, but some of it will be, it, it depends what, what system we're sort of looking at. Um, and it's, it's, you know, if you've got a, a blind side inspection equipment, you've got to get access to that as well to build up the data. So that's something we're working with uh, London Underground to make sure we can get sort of a, 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 a nice transition with the train as it comes in and introduce things as the train comes in as well. Sure, great. Thank you. Um, couple of points. Um, Toby, did you want to open the mics up generally for uh, more wider comments? Yep, um, now yeah, be able to unmute if people want to raise their hands and unmute. We can, can't see any hands up at the moment. Sure, okay. Question, but we'll wait for a moment. Um, I had a I had a question. The as my, myself, I'm, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to ask. So the 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 um, multi-articulated car concepts really exciting um i was just wondering whether there's any um from a maintainer's point of view do they ever need to uncouple that uh non non bogey car for uh, and and how how, how does that work it supported you must have thought about that already yeah no no, no it is something that we're, we're working um working with uh, obviously the depot sort of people as well um, the articulation itself, uh, the, the main sort of bearing uh, is, is, a 20, is 20 years, life to 20 years. So you would own it. And we've developed equipment that allows us to remove it from under, take the bearing out from underneath. Um, so we just need to support the cars with uh, jacks or, or, or however we, we look at to support that uh, IM car um, and that. So um, for things like ERU, they'll have um, sort of a, an emergency sort of, uh, dare I say, it's not a skate, but it, it wheels that they can quickly mount underneath it that the, the train can sort of sit on as well. So uh, all that concept is being looked at, uh, how we sort of, you know, quick, how we can efficiently um, do things with the, with the IM cars. That's great. Thank you, Paul. Um, I don't have any hands up. I think John, did John Atkins, did you want to ask a question? Do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, hi. Uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. Really enjoying this. Um, you spoke a lot about uh, reducing the weight of the train 
um, as much as possible. But at the same time, of course, you're loading more and more capability into the train. So are, are we going to end up with trains that are lighter in weight than the current rolling stock or, or not? Uh, yes, because we've reduced the, the main the main um, the main weight that uh, that we've managed to reduce is the number of the bogies. The bogies are a considerable sort of area that carry the weight. Uh, so by reducing the number of almost half in the bogies, really what you would see on a normal sort of conventional sort of style, uh, that that takes off a lot of the weight. And also how we've uh, sort of built the car bodies up as well uh, and the structures behind that, uh, how we sort of built everything also saves weight. Good, well done, thank you. So I had a follow up question um, from John's question. Um, so with how, how do um, axle uh, weights, uh, axle loads, compare obviously a light a light train overall but fewer fewer axles How yeah the, the axle loading is is more um uh, if you compare it to, to but you know we built it and designed it so that it that that should not be uh, an issue brilliant thank you um this question just come up in the chat um about uh your your one team approach. Um, I enjoyed uh, reading some of those uh, um, your ethics. I thought they were really practical and uh, um, really good to see you taking that one team approach. Um, but uh, you've seen asked how does uh, that work to integrate with the wider deep tube program? Um, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, one team actually um, it changes as you go through the phases. So we're just going through a, a transitional phase now um, because obviously the majority of the team were engineers uh, in the design process we are now obviously got our manufacturing team uh, have joined us um, and it will be the same for uh, on the on the customer side as we as we get closer obviously um, there'll be more people in London Underground particularly on the maintenance side um, that, that be become part of this family so it's not ex it's not an exclusive club it's basically any anybody and everybody who's contributing to the outcome for delivering this program on time and to the quality that we want it uh, to be uh, will be included in that detail one team so it will membership will will change um, as we go through the program but the concept yeah. stays the same, of course, and then yeah. it's about educating the people as they come into the team. That's the one. It's um, it's something that you can't just. Um, we're all we're all guilty of doing that in organisations where you just you forget about every year. There's new people that join, um, and you also have to do a lot of revision. So one of the things that we're planning now, as we're coming out of hopefully coming out of um, the home offices and, and we have started to, we had our first face 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 to face meeting with, with with each other. Actually, some of us did back in last month is to is to is to go back round some of these collaboration um, parts now uh, with a focus on what we do in the next 12 to 24 months and who, who needs to be involved in that. Mm. Yeah, it's a real challenge. Um, uh, Steve, you, Steve Bristow, you've got your hand up. Do you want to unmute, ask your question? Uh, yeah, so Steve. I was just gonna, I was just gonna add to that and uh, and give Dave a bit of a hand on that last question, Toby, if you don't mind. So I, I, I have the uh, the honour, and it is an honour, of working with Siemens um, on the TFL side and leading the team that are um, introducing the new fleet for the um, deep tube or for the Piccadilly Line Upgrade Program. Um, so I also have the interface team um, and the integration team on the Piccadilly line upgrade um, under me. So uh, it really it is, as Dave says, a much wider one team environment. Um, and you saw earlier images of the um, underframe mock up and we've already done work with the depots team and the maintenance teams on those underframe mock ups. And we're working together to uh, manage those interfaces 
Um, and, and the wider TNC that's coming is, is one of the next big steps to ensure we manage that integration. Um, so Dave really hit the nail on the head. It is one team to successfully deliver the Piccadilly line upgrade. Um, so that's infrastructure, systems, depots, TNC, um, and everybody just joins at the appropriate time. Thanks, Steve. That's great. Good to hear it from the client side too. Working. Um, just having a look in the chat, I don't think we have any more questions. Yeah. Happy to sum up there if you like. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Well, so, um, so many thanks, Dave and Paul. Um, Herf and Dave and Paul from Siemens, um, really taking us through um, how partnership working is uh, is really the core of uh, this contract over you know, a long period of time for 20 years plus. Uh, as we just heard, there one team collaboration between TfL and Siemens. Um, I took us through the challenges of how that design has emerged, kind of almost completely virtually and online over the last couple of years. Um, and the uh, the challenges about introducing a very unconventional and uh, innovative train design onto the underground network. Challenges include including technical operation, uh, operational challenges, um, particularly around kind of introducing a high capacity air cooled train for the first time. Um, challenges around energy, track drainage or sorry, track damage rather, and and, um, and maintenance aspects. We heard more about the design, uh, a multi articulated uh, jointed train for the first time. Um, 10 bogies over nine cars, so very innovative from that point of view. And um, HVAC in terms of it, that's introduction and uh, we just, just spoke in the questions there about uh, mounting of that underneath the car, which is uh, somewhat unusual. Um, the extensive use of mock-ups has been important, both for cab, uh, saloon, human factors testing, etc. Again, largely done um, virtually, which has been uh, quite a first. Um, and the use, current use of underframe mock-ups, as was just spoken about there by Steve, for maintenance trials and optimising the design for accessibility and maintenance, which is uh, extremely important in the uh, in the long term. Um, a very digital train. We spoke in the chat again about um, automation for maintenance, condition monitoring, remote uh, monitoring and control. Um, so a hardy digital train uh, for with high levels of automation going forward. And finally, um, a brief glimpse, very interesting too, uh, of the twin site concept for manufacture, uh, including Vienna and the Gaul. Interesting to note that I'll be um, running in parallel by the end of 2024. And uh, we heard a little bit about the uh, recently constructed RAISE facility, uh, which obviously is an opportunity to uh, to engage uh, with the whole industry and, uh, and raise the level, raise the bar for skills and um, and uh, engagement there. So thanks. Uh, it's been long awaited. We've had a couple of guys are trying to organise this uh, over the last couple of years uh, and we've uh, we finally got there. So thanks very much, Dave and Paul, for uh, coming tonight. I'm sure uh, there's probably more opportunities downstream as we get into manufacture, and um, I'm sure there's an opportunity to share more uh, perhaps in the future. So perhaps we'll invite you back and uh, share more in, in the future. So thank you again for that. I'll hand over to Toby. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I think that was beautifully said. Yeah, thanks very much to you both um, for taking time out your busy, busy day. And coming to um, give us a really, really great presentation. Um, great, and uh, yeah, I hope we can have a, have a, um, a future presentation when um, uh, when these uh, uh, train, maybe when we've got a pre-production train or, um, uh, and we can learn a little bit more about the solutions that you come up with to meet these challenges. So yeah, once again, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate it and uh, yeah. To everyone else, thank you very much for attending and hope we will see you um, soon on the 18th of October at our next presentation. Um, if you want to hang around for a bit more discussion, um, we can leave the meeting open. Otherwise, I'll bid you all a very good evening and uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Bye.